Welcome back to Solar Impulse TV, live from the Mission Control Center in Monaco. My name is Kari Lundgren, and it is a pleasure to welcome you back. But I think you think I'm a weather forecast, maybe not. Um, Bertrand Picard and Solar Impulse have been in the air for almost two, two full days, and they are well on their way to San Francisco, looking to land uh, in the... Oh, okay. <laughs> no worries, I thought. Got a little technical problem. Welcome back to Solar Impulse TV, live from the Mission Control Center in Monaco. My name is Kari Lundgren, and it is a pleasure to welcome you back. Solar Impulse 2 and Bertrand are well on their way to Moffett Airfield, just southeast of San Francisco in the heart of Silicon Valley. Everything seems to be going well. They've been flying almost two full days, and we're actually at quite a key point for the team, which is energy neutral, uh, energy neutral morning. And here to explain a little bit more about that, I've got Peter Fry, who's head of systems and one of the oldest members of the team here at Solar Impulse. So first, Peter, I'm going to ask you to explain Energy Neutral Morning for those viewers who are unfamiliar with the term. Okay, we just created this name. And uh, it's the name for when the sun energy is uh, high enough to keep the aircraft flying horizontal at optimum speed. So we don't consume battery energy anymore. So from that moment on, we can fly horizontal, we can slightly start to climb with the sun rising, or we can fill the batteries. So this is kind of some, quite an important moment, because it basically means this is a moment when solar impulse is basically being powered by the sun, essentially. Yes, this is the most important moment in the morning, because if you don't reach that point, you either have to lose altitude to, uh, go over, to sort of go over the time uh, until that moment, or you, you ditch, uh, because that's the moment where uh, you can sort of hook on the new energy of the new day. Exactly, I like that, hooking on to the new energy of the new day. Um, so Peter, as I was just saying, you are one of the oldest members of the Solar Impulse team, and uh, maybe tell me a little bit about how you got involved in the project, and also, I mean, it's such an amazing airplane, but I think sometimes, given how successful the flight has been so far, people may forget of what a technical challenge it was, and I remember discussing that with you, and you were telling me about how you know how complicated it was to even come up with the design so two questions there so yeah, okay so I start historically why I'm in the team uh, I met Andre in the Swiss Air Force because we were together in a fighter squadron I was uh, Air Force pilot as well not a professional as Andre he also was not a professional we were milice pilots uh, part-time pilots and uh, he was the first uh, to be engaged by uh, Bertrand um, when he started the project at APFL uh, Lausanne at uh, the technical, technical, technical university. In, yeah. We have in Switzerland two universities. One is the ETH, the old one in Zurich, and the newer one, but the same. They are sister universities, the EPFL in Lausanne. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bertrand started with the EPFL, the project, and they 
saw the need for a project leader with some experience in industry, and Andre had experience with bringing startups to Silicon Valley from Switzerland. So they uh, uh, asked him whether he would be interested, since they knew he's a pilot, a former military pilot and an engineer. So. Mm -hmm. And then Andre went into that team with uh, a lot of institutes of the APFL, and he saw that somebody with some experience in aircraft design should be brought in. And knowing me, he, he called me and said, hey, there's an interesting secret project at the moment. <laughs> Would you be interested? So I, at the beginning, I was not so sure because I wanted to talk with my wife. Yeah. Whether it's, uh, I knew it, it would be an adventure, yeah. and then I really uh, was enthusiastic uh, to, to develop the project together with Andre and Bertrand, and uh, we built up the technical team together, the ideas how to approach the project. Well, and that's it. I mean, it's just like no airplane that you'd ever, I mean, how did you approach it? There's, I mean, no airplane like this before. So was, did you use basic air, airplane concepts, or did you have to tap into other, other sort of techniques and skills to make it work? Um, I studied uh, mechanical engineering at the ETH in Zurich, and I was focusing on aerodynamics, fluid dynamics, and lightweight structures. And I was in a few uh, projects uh, in industry uh, because I'm, I'm self-employed, still self-employed. And um, so I, I was part of, of uh, airplane developing teams. And um, I knew that this airplane is really going out of the box. I mean, we had to invent something totally new that is something that is super light, mm -hmm. that is very efficient, that flies very slow, because the solar energy has to be used at low energy, not to, uh, because you cannot fly fast with, with little energy yeah. amount. And uh, so we knew we have to go into new fields, but knowing that if you do something new, you should not stretch the, the carpet. I mean, you should, should uh, select a concept that is more or less uh, known, or you can know what, where you end. Yeah. That's why we selected a glider-like uh, basic concept. We have some details on the aircraft, let's say yeah. this, uh, this cross-shaped uh, tail, tail to avoid some torsion on the fuselage, etc. But basically we said we want to do something that is simple because we don't have a big team and uh, that we can really calculate and, and optimize. And, and knowing, and that, you know, when you say energy neutral, yeah. you only can do that if you know more or less by 1% what is the performance, the overall performance of the aircraft with the uncertainty of the energy available because the sun sometimes has to, to go through haze, yeah. whatever. So yeah, this is uh, reducing, yeah, it reduces the we amount. have some uncertainties on the meteorologic side, but we should not have uncertainties on the technical side. Yeah. Well, and then tell me, I mean, what the parameters, like when you, in terms of wingspan, that it had to have a certain amount of area for the solar, solar cells. I mean, what do you consider the hardest part of actually building this airplane? Yeah, I mean, you have the conceptual phase where you have to find out the physics, the mm -hmm. physical uh, basics. And there's, there's one formula which relates, if you, if you consider that the, the surface of the wing is the main element where you can sort of... Uh, uh, use as a reference area because the reference area creates the lift and it, crea it creates the power because most of the solar cells are on the wing. Yeah. So there is a relation between available power average per day and uh, the, the weight per square meter that you can, uh, can have on your aircraft. Yeah. And uh, with this formula you can start and invent a mission and that's how we did it. We had uh, Paul McCready, you know, the great American yeah. uh, solar, uh, solar, uh, solar pioneer. What was it? It was, the, it's called, it was called something like the Gossamer Penguin. Yes, yes. Penguin, yes. Condor, and so on. He, he started with a, a human-powered uh, airplane. He was the first to, to win that Kremer Prize uh, that went uh, to surround the triangle. Uh, I think 10 meters above ground was the, re, uh, the, the, the rule to fly. And he was the first to win that, and then he went on with solar power. He was the first to cross the channel mm -hmm. from, you know, in Europe yeah. with a solar aircraft, etc. And Andre and I went to visit him. Before, I mean, he died a few years ago, unfortunately, yeah. but we uh, met him in, in uh, California. And he told us, the batteries are still too heavy, so you have to do it as I would do it. He told, yeah. uh, go uh, store a part of the energy in altitude and the rest in the battery. That's what we are doing. Yeah. We, that's why we There's climb so high. And battery and, mm -hmm. yeah, potential energy and battery energy. Right. Yeah. So we climbed to 8,500 meters, uh, gliding down during four hours and flying horizontal at very low altitude where you don't lose a lot of energy because you can fly slower with the more dense uh, 
uh, air, air. Yeah. Uh, eight hours, and that means we have uh, we could sort of reduce one third of a, a let's say hypothetical max battery weight if you want to fly horizontal. Mm -hmm. And this is a lot, you know, because the battery of this aircraft is 600 kilo. We, so we Which would have a had a quarter of the weight of the aircraft. Yeah, right? yeah. it's a lot. And, and so, you know, this, this uh, talking to experts and finding out what would be the best way with, with own ideas uh, brought us to the, to the concepts and to the, to the aircraft we have now today. Well, when it's the first solar airplane that can fly day and night, something very, very special. Yeah, we are the first ones, yeah. Sure, we, we, Andre made in 2010 the world record of an aircraft flying through the night, 26 hours on solar power, power only. And I mean, now, by doing this repetitive, you prove that you really can do it constant, uh, that the pilot is the limiting the, factor yeah, because he has factors. to, yeah, human factor. Has to come down, has to stretch his legs and, sure. yeah. He has to drink and I mean, sometime you have no water anymore on board yeah. and you are tired, etc. So I've got and one last question then for you, and then I'm going to let you go because I know you have other things to do, which is, I mean, things have been going so smoothly on this flight, you know, and there are definitely things that we still are focusing on. We're not there yet. But what is, in, in your years with Solar Impulse, what was the moment when you sort of faced the most challenge? Was it in Nagoya last year, or was it actually when the spar broke back, you know, many years ago? Yeah, there were many moments, but let's say from the initial goal to fly with this air, I mean, we, we, we imagined it's, fo it's feasible, but we, we have to, had to prove. And so when it flies, if any, when something breaks, that's development risk. And it's, it's, it's uh, sad because it, it throws you back one year, a lot of money is wasted. But actually, the, the flight through the, the first flight of the first aircraft, of course, was very special. Yeah. Then Andre's world record, 26 hours through the night with the old aircraft. And the flight uh, to Hawaii, because it's the longest flight, it's a world record that will last for long, I guess. Yeah. And will not be topped by a fuel-powered uh, aircraft, I guess. Yeah. You know, because it's long, 120 hours. Yeah. Um, this was really special. When we saw that we, we can do it, because it was risky, we never were flying so long, so far. And the rescue side, you know, if Andre would have, have to ditch with the aircraft, yeah, it would have been difficult to find him in this big ocean. And for me today, you know, it's a very special moment because we see the end of crossing Pacific, which is a huge, huge ocean. Yeah. And tomorrow or this night, we will uh, land in San Francisco. So uh, that the big ocean is crossed. So for us, it's uh, it's uh, very important. What huge, we do. huge, huge moment of triumph. I've got actually one more question for you, which I thought I forgot to ask. Which is, you know, one thing about Solar Impulse is it has this enormous wingspan, and not every airport can can handle it. So we've got a, a mobile hangar that yes. is that. And so tell me a little bit about the mobile hangar. Yeah, Andre uh, felt very early that we need to be independent from uh, tents or other hangars. Uh, because the aircraft is delicate, if we have a lot of wind on ground, we have to to, to make a shelter to to have uh, to protect it. And uh, then we he was looking for uh, ideas and for people, and uh, we found in Switzerland uh, people that were in the uh, in this yacht uh, business, sailing, sailing, yeah, business. sailing business. They were inventing this uh, this laminated foil sails that they use today for this high speed uh, regatta. And these guys said, yeah, we have ideas, and we do something like an air mattress. You know, it's 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 a uh, with, uh, inflated, inflated yeah, with yeah. pressure inside, and it's light. Uh, it's uh, easy to, to uh, uh, let's say, to store, to transport, and uh, but it, it took quite some time because at the end you find out you have to mount it. Yeah. And you know these these structures, you can you can climb on the structure. Somebody has to go up and hook it together, <laughs> and so you know it's really yeah, it's, it's a really a, a, an, it's a masterpiece of of, uh, of a hangar. And uh, it's big, you know. It yeah. has. Well, it takes ten hours to put together, or something like that. Yeah, Six it's, to, it's, maybe it's a, a, it's a few yeah. hours uh, yeah. to to put it together. And what is special, you know, the the the, air, the hangar has to be opened. Half of the hangar has to be opened. The aircraft is sideways put into the the, the one half, and the other one half is slided onto the aircraft. And this is this is special, you know. We like this. We are independent worldwide. Well, and actually, um, you've described it very well, but we actually have some images of precisely this uh, situation, the mobile hangar, and uh, we will share those with you now. Well, there are a lot of unknown about this around the world and, for example, the destination airport. So, assuming that we go on a planned airport, we will have a tent or a fixed hangar waiting for us. 
But what if we divert? What if for weather condition we have to land somewhere we did not plan to? Well, here we have the mobile hangar and we can mount quickly the mobile hangar to protect the aircraft. The fabric used for this mobile hangar comes from the sailing world. Uh, it's waterproof, fireproof, it has ripstops and uh, it's inflated by uh, fans. And uh, we do not need to use all the fan at full power, it just depends on the wind speed. So the more wind we have, the higher the pressure inside the two fabric skin is. So to set up this uh, mobile hangar, uh, we need uh, roughly four to five hours to be ready uh, for the airplane to be protected. To completely close the mobile hangar, we need six to seven hours. And to make sure that this hangar will stand uh, 100 km per hour of wind, this is the worst case, uh, we would need something like 10 hours. Well, many of you probably know that yesterday was Earth Day, and it was also the day that the Paris Climate, uh, cl uh, climate Agreement got signed and uh, in New York. And so we thought it would be appropriate to bring to you an interview that I did with Christina Figueres uh, of the UNFCCC. Here is that interview. Welcome back to Solar Impulse TV. With us today we have Cristina Figueres, Executive Director of the UNFCCC. Cristina, great to have you with us. And what hurdles remain? Are you optimistic? I think the hurdle that remains is actually to take the Paris Agreement and actually make it a reality. It was uh, the work of thousands and thousands of people from all walks of life, from every single country in the world, to come to this Paris Agreement. And it was certainly a, uh, a heavy lift uh, for everyone, but a very uh, celebratory event once we, reached, uh, once we reached the agreement. But without disrespecting the work that we have all put in and what uh, the amount of hours and energy and dedication that we've all invested into the Paris Agreement, frankly, that was the easy part. Now the rubber hits the road, or rather, in my new terminology, now the sun hits the panel. Because now is when we really must make a difference. Now is where we take all of those good intents that are cemented in the Paris Agreement and make them a reality. So go first in the Paris Agreement is to carve out the vision, and now we have to go from the vision to the reality. Much more difficult. What skills have you used most in your years as a negotiator and activist? I think the skills that have uh, that have served me well um, have been perhaps first listening uh, in order to understand where different countries, where different sectors, where different corporations, where different interests are coming from, and be very, very uh, a very keen listener to understand the nuances in the positions and the interests of everyone. So listening very important respect, a deep respect for the differences that are on the table. You can never assume that two countries, that two sectors, that two, in fact two companies in the same sector are going to go at this uh, uh, the same way. And so a respect for the differences that are on the table has always uh, been a, a landmark of uh, being able to move forward. And finally, determination, determination that despite all of these differences and because of all of these differences that actually enrich our experience, we must come and we had to and we did come to, uh, to a global agreement. So the determination to move forward, if you will, to look at the stars uh, while we have our boots uh, heavy in the mud, uh, both of the, all of three of those, so listening, respect and determination have actually been uh, quite helpful. And in the grand scheme of things, where does a project like Solar Impulse fit in? So I have always been a, a fan of Solar Impulse and of, uh, of the two fantastic uh, pilots uh, that have developed this, uh, this concept and are brave enough uh, to get into that, uh, into that plane. And the reason why I have been such a fan is because uh, I, do, I do see that what Solar Impulse is doing here is it is breaking through self-imposed barriers of possibility. 
we did not think before solar impulse that it would be possible to uh, traverse long distances with zero emissions uh, in any flying vehicle. And uh, the fact that they have proven uh, that this is possible, the fact that they are up in the air again uh, and finishing the, uh, the world around flight that they had initiated really just proves that uh, impossible is not a fact, it is an attitude. Thank you for your time, Christina. It's been great having you with us. Stay tuned on Solar Impulse TV as the adventure continues. Oh, I'm frozen, frozen on the screen, I think, it looks like. <laughs> uh, well, I think uh, hopefully that image, uh, hopefully that image will change. Oh, there. Oh, even we've got this is right. We've got highlights from Hawaii. So the next thing I want to show you are highlights from the takeoff, not me. Highlights from the takeoff. So this was actually a departure dance by one of our very wonderful Hawaiian friends. So taken two days ago. There is our there is our next guest. He is an air traffic controller called Martin, and uh, the reason he is on the phone is probably because he is an air traffic controller. They are often on the phone, which is why here at the Monaco Control Center we actually have them in a separate room, which you can see there. Um, and he's probably coordinating with either Oakland or San Francisco International or one of the many airports we're going to be having to navigate around to get to Moffett Airfield. But as I said, the air traffic controllers, very important people here at the Monaco Control Center, they're in the separate room at the back. And then actually, I don't know if we can zoom out and show a little bit more of the MCC for those of us who are not familiar with it. Ah, there we go. Yes, that's the whole Monaco Control Center. So this is the front room. Uh, the people in this room, this is what we call real time. So these are all people that are immediately dealing with a uh, pilot and looking at information that he is sending them. Julian uh, is the CAPCOM. That's the person that speaks directly with the pilot. Uh, you have that person there because it is important for the pilot to only have one person speaking to him at one time. And if he's getting a lot of different information from various people, that may makes it hard for him to do his job. Uh, then we have various electrical engineers. This is Martin. He's from our partner Schindler. And actually, we have some of the Swisscom guys there in charge of communication off to the left of the screen there. In the back room, we have our mission engineers. They are actually already planning for what's next, which is 
quite an important job. Actually, after Moffett Airfield, we will be heading to Phoenix and then across the United States. That is already being planned and organized. You see Luc Trelemont, he's actually going to be on the show a little bit later, and uh, he's already looking at weather patterns for, well, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, next week, basically, to fly to Phoenix. So it looks like... Oh, I think what we're going to do next, because Martin is still busy, is we're actually going to show you a conversation between Bertrand and Ban Ki-moon. They spoke last night. It was a very significant day, as I was saying. It was the day that the climate uh, deal that was discussed and debated in Paris last year got signed in New York, and Ban Ki-moon uh, spoke to Bertrand uh, from, and Bertrand, of course, was in the cockpit and over the middle of the Pacific. Here is a clip of that chat. I have the sound from New York in the cockpit of Solar Impulse. I don't know if you hear me. Hello. Hello, Solar Pulse. Hello, Captain Picard. Where are you now flying? <laughs> good, Can you hear good, me? Good afternoon, oh, yeah. Mr. Secretary General. Yes, Mr. Secretary General, I hear you, Excellencies. Yes, I, I speak to you from the cockpit of Solar Impulse in the middle of the Pacific, flying on solar power, only, no fuel. I took off yesterday from Hawaii. I'm now flying and landing tomorrow evening in San Francisco. So it can seem to be the future, it's science fiction, but not, it's the reality. It's today what clean technologies can achieve impossible things like flying day and night with no fuel on a solar airplane. That's, uh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this historic thing. You look like an asteroid in the moon. You look great. You know, you great. Mr. Secretary <laughs> General, yes, what, what you are doing today in New York, signing the Paris Climate Agreement, is more than protecting the environment. It is the launch of the clean technology revolution. And this revolution is going to replace the old polluting devices, polluting and inefficient like combustion engines, incandescent light bulbs, badly insulated houses, old grids of distribution of electricity. All this is going to disappear. This is causing the CO2. This is causing the pollution. And today, what is fantastic is that we have profitable solutions, not expensive problems, profitable solutions, like the one on this airplane, electrical motors that are 97% efficient, insulation forms for houses to make them independent from the grid. All this airplane is like a smart grid, collecting energy, distributing energy with very, very high efficiency. And this is exactly what the world needs. This is a huge market. It creates jobs. It makes profit. It makes a clean increase in GDP and economical development because it's the market of the future. And the one who understands it will at the same time be successful in their industry and at the same time protect the environment and fight climate change. This is the hope that we need to have today, to have the action today. And uh, Switzerland, by the way, you know, I salute my friend, Vice President of Switzerland, Doris Leutart. She understood that, and she is pushing very hard in Switzerland. But there is so much resistance everywhere. So be pioneers, be adventurers, be explorers of the solutions of today. This is how we can make a better world. Don't let the resistance take over. Because we have the solution. We're actually going to interrupt this broadcast because Bertrand is about to speak to Prince Albert, so we're going to let you listen in on their conversation. Am I off? Prince is on. Okay. I connect, yeah? 
Hello, Monseigneur. This is uh, MCC Monaco. You are now connected to uh, with Bertrand Pico. Okay. Thank you very much. Hi. Hello. Hello, Albert. Bertrand. Je t'entends avec plaisir. Hello, Albert. Oui. Écoute, c'est un troisième jour extraordinaire. Bon, déjà, être trois jours de suite en vol. Dans le même vol et avec le même avion, il y a peu de gens qui, qui ont fait ça. Hein. Eh oui. André l'a fait l'année dernière. Eh oui. Il y a Dick Routan qui l'a fait avec Jenna Yeager. Il y a Steve Fossett eh oui. qui l'a fait. Euh, et, mais et sinon, euh, tu vois, ça devient une expérience vraiment exceptionnelle. Et puis ce matin, écoute, quand je suis sorti d'une petite phase de repos, j'ouvre oui. les yeux, l'horizon complètement rouge. Complètement rouge. Le soleil était... Juste pas encore levé, mais tout le ciel était rouge à cause de quelques petits russes. C'était absolument magnifique. Mais quel privilège d'être là. <rire> c'est fantastique. Bah écoute, c'était formidable. Je... Je, te... Je te félicite. Et euh, j'ai beaucoup pensé à toi de... depuis Madrid, où euh, j'ai euh, inauguré la... la branche espagnole de, de la fondation. et J'ai pu euh, parler de bien sûr, de, de ce Larry Post. Et puis, euh, et puis là, aujourd'hui, euh, j'arrive de la, de la fin de la, du podium de la course de Formula E à Paris, qui était un grand succès. Et, Excellent. Euh, et euh, on a parlé de toi aussi avec euh, la maire de Paris et avec, euh, avec le Premier ministre Val, qui était là, et avec Jean Todd. Et donc, on, on a beaucoup... Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, so um, we have to speak in English. I was I was so happy to remember that French was still an official language <laughs> in the world, but we have to go back to English. I'm that's sorry. okay. <laughs> no, but I was saying, no. <laughs> Bertrand, that uh, we uh, thought of you with uh, with uh, the Prime Minister of France and uh, the, the Mayor of Paris uh, uh, during the Formula E Grand Prix. That just finished here in Paris and uh, uh, talked about, uh, of course, uh, alternative energies and uh, and their great promise. And what a greater example than Solar Impulse and and what you are doing right now. And we are very happy and proud. Hey, thank you, thank you. That's exciting. Yeah. Who, who who won? Well, what, what was the it was, uh, it, the it was won by Lucas De Grassi. The Brazilian driver and uh, uh, the, the French driver Vergne, uh, uh, Charles Vergne, and uh, Sebastian Buemi of uh, Switzerland, uh, third. Of oh, Switzerland, so, uh, Sebastian was third. Yes. Hey, wonderful. So it was a good result. France, it was really, France it, and Switzerland can be happy. <laughs> nice it was race. beautiful. It, it, was, was, uh, it was a nice it, race. It was a nice race and a nice setting there on the Uh, the esplanade of the Invalides, and so uh, it was really a, and a pretty big crowd, 15,000 people, so it was uh, really a, a good, good success. No, it's wonderful, and you know, Alejandro Ag Agar, who, yes. who launched that, who had the idea, who, who did it, he's such a pioneer, huh? because when he started, everybody said, you are crazy, it will never work, it doesn't yeah. make noise. Uh, it's, it's too different. The cars must have gasoline. Yeah. And he persevered, and he, oh, yeah. he made it happen. Huh? And I'm so no. happy because it's a big success now. And in no, 10 is. or 20 years, people will probably forget that cars have gasoline one day. <laughs> it's true, which is great. And uh, no, he's a, he's a really uh, he's a wonderful guy, and he's worked so hard at this. So I'm I'm very happy for him as well. But listen. Yes. But But the, the the so how, how are you wear... feeling physically? It, well, it I'm feeling well. Difficult? But I just would like to, I just would like to go back with the one thing you said that you were in Madrid to yes. open the Spanish branch of your foundation, and I think this needs also to be understood by the English-speaking people because it was in French before, and it's so good what you are doing with your foundation. And um, you know, when we will arrive in New York, the American branch. Is yes. of course invited. We're in contact with them. They will bring their members. They will bring their supporters. I don't know if 
you have a branch already in San Francisco? Uh, no. Uh, well, the the uh, the U.S. branch is is the one that's on the East Coast, but it but it covers also the West Coast, and uh, I don't know if they've sent someone <laughs> over there to greet you as well, but um, uh, I hope they will. But uh, but I but, but that's wonderful that they're going to be a part of it, and uh, of course. Uh, uh, you are one of ours. Well, you do such so, a good job. So it's, but uh, you know, normally, the, normally, normally it's only former heads of state like a foundation. And yeah. in your case, I think you're the only one in the world with a head of state in power who has a foundation for the protection of, of the environment and natural resources. So this has to be said. Uh, it's really courageous. I really admire you for what you're doing. Oh, well, thank you, Barton. Well, you know, it's... Uh, it's uh, Personal engagement uh, that was uh, uh, that I put to myself a few years ago, and uh, well, started the foundation ten years ago, as you know. But uh, it uh, yep. was uh, really a personal wish of mine to make that commitment to uh, to try to help in uh, in uh, everything that touches our planet. And uh, yeah, uh, exactly. And you know, I was so happy because yesterday, during Earth Day, I could make a live speech at the United Nations headquarters in New York from Solar Impulse. Really? For Earth Day and for the signature of the Paris Agreement. And it worked perfectly well. That's I could address to all the, the heads of states who were there, have a short discussion with Ban Ki-moon mm -hmm. and the Minister of Energy and Environment of Switzerland, Doris Neutart. So that was my dream, you know, since such a long time, to be able to to link completely the world of exploration and the yeah. official world uh, to protect the environment. So that that was really funny. It worked. You know, I, I, I think I had more butterflies in the stomach before that live transmission because I was hoping that it would really work mm -hmm. than when I took off with Solar Impulse three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. I, I can understand that. It's... Uh, yeah. Not easy to talk uh, in front of uh, so many countries at the UN, even when it's live. So uh, uh, probably even more when it's uh, but you did it, huh? a few thousand you miles away. You did it several times, and it's useful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so, so now the flight is going very well. Yes. I'm uh, I'm in a very I'm in a very good shape. I do my physical exercise every morning. Mm -hmm. You know, I live. I live in that plane, you know, it's not only flying, I mean, actually yeah. it's not a lot of flying because there's an autopilot, uh -huh. so um, I make my exercise, meditation, yoga, stretching, I eat, I cook, hot meals, I sleep, I use the toilet, I do the <laughs> housekeeping, <laughs> it's fun, and I do that in the middle of the sky, in the middle of the biggest ocean of the world. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic, but but so uh, but uh, Bertrand, what's the what's the uh, ETA? What's the estimated time of arrival? Uh, uh, as far as you so know, so I will now. arrive during. Yes, so landing landing will be late evening, mm -hmm. uh, probably shortly before or around midnight in Buffalo, yes. which is the airport of the Silicon Valley. Uh, yeah. So just close to Google. Oh, and that's before fantastic. that. If, if everything goes well, if the plane goes well and the weather is still good in San Francisco, I will arrive uh, through the Golden Gate. Oh, that's fantastic. And uh, come above the Golden Gate, meet André. André is uh, welcoming me with a helicopter. And then <laughs> I will stay a part of the afternoon inside the Bay of San Francisco, above Alcatraz. Oh, really? And uh, that will be a nice way. Yeah, I, I look so much forward. It will be a nice way. To, to say hello when I arrive to San Francisco. And then after that, I will exit the bay and go through the through the hills where there are no, no populated areas to arrive to Buffett late, late evening. So the arrival should be spectacular. I hope yeah. everything will work well with the weather, with the plane and everything. And uh, so it's not over yet in terms of beauty, in terms of suspense. In terms of emotions, a lot of, lot of things still to come. And then continue, of course, we, yes, of we course. probably continue quite quickly. Uh, Audrey, Audrey will, uh, 
take the plane to our post uh, as soon as possible to bring it uh, to Phoenix and uh, from there continue and uh, he will make the flight arriving to New York to fly over the Statue of Liberty. Oh, well, great. Great. Now, that'll be fantastic. I'm sure he will... Uh, uh, that'll be great for him. But, but that arrival in... Uh, San Francisco, I, I I can't wait to see the uh, see those uh, shots over the Golden Gate. That should be spectacular and yes. very emotional. Ah, yes, and Audrey, Audrey is a fantastic helicopter pilot. So when he flies next to me, or I, I should say when he dances next to me with a helicopter and with a cameraman and the photographer, it's uh -huh. always like a ballet. And uh, he always takes the good angles to make good pictures. So you will see probably really beautiful shots if we can make it happen. Oh, well, that'll be fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. Well, listen, that's uh, it's all very exciting. And uh, I can't wait to uh, get back to the uh, MCC uh, to, uh, yes. to see the rest of the flight and uh, to... Uh, Follow you even more closely, and I hope everybody will uh, will be joining us uh, either live. Absolutely, or you know everybody in the MCC is so happy that you are coming coming to see them, and uh, you are really part of the team. And I have the impression they they never told me, but I have the impression that the first thing that they check when they find the weather window is to be sure that you are available in Monaco to be in the MCC. <laughs> Well, we, let's say that there's a good communication between uh, my staff and uh, and, uh, and Raymond and, and all his team there to uh, uh, make yeah. sure that I am available <laughs> and I make myself available. Yeah, absolutely, that's great. Yeah, yeah. And and um, that's that's and what's the weather right now uh, where where your position is? So right nice now, I, it's, it's above me, very nice weather. Below, it's completely overcasted. It's oh, low really? clouds, uh, low stratu, yeah, low stratu cumulus, but very, very low. Huh? They are uh, uh, 1,000 meters above the above the ocean. Oh really? So I have the the sky clear for me, with a couple of cirrus and alto cumulus uh, that are uh, here and there. Uh -huh. uh, there should be bad weather coming. Uh, in 24 hours or 36 hours, so it's the first sign of a, of a front, but I will fly in front of it, okay. so uh, it, uh, it should not disturb me. So, to answer short, it's beautiful weather, yeah. I'm oh, really fantastic. happy, I get a lot of energy. You know, oh, it's, it, it's very it's very early in the morning, huh? we are two hours after sunrise, yeah. and I still, and I already have, already have a uh, uh, more than 10 kilowatt hours of uh, of uh, yeah. solar energy on on every on every uh, uh, gondola. So so it's really great. Oh, that's fantastic! So the new uh, all this energy is available for the world and people don't use it. It's crazy when you imagine. I know when you think of it. When you think of uh, uh, that now, the technology is is there. Uh, to uh, harness solar energy and to use it for different ways, and, uh, not only for transportation, of course, uh, but for for housing and for uh, different uh, commodities. Yeah. It's uh, it's absolutely for me. Uh, I know for you also. It's unbelievable that uh, people don't use it more. Don't uh, uh, yeah. uh, turn toward it for. Well, for I their use needs. as much as I can today. Yeah, I tell you today, I use as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I hope you will. But we have to encourage other people to do it. But hopefully, with the solar Absolutely. impulse, it'll be a great example for for everybody. Yes, I hope. <laughs> yeah, it's the goal, huh? It's really the goal. Yeah. Well, great, Bertrand. Well, listen, I uh, I don't want to keep you. I you probably have some housekeeping to do <laughs> but um, I'm, in the, I'm in the head of the breakfast it was really <laughs> nice to, to hear you Albert uh, thank it's you wonderful so much thank to you hear so you. much for calling 
Yeah, it's, it's a great pleasure. In, in and a few uh, hours, in a few hours, we talk again when you're in the MTT. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bertrand. And, uh, great. Thank uh, you to you. Have a great uh, last few hours up in the sky. Thank you. Yes, I enjoy it. I enjoy it as much as I can. Yeah. Okay. Talk to you later, Abel. Thank okay, you. thank you so bye much, bye. Bertrand. Bye-bye. And a big kiss. A big kiss to the family. Big kiss I to will. The family. I will. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, live conversation there between Bertrand Picard and Prince Albert of Monaco. Prince Albert, a patron of the Solar Impulse Project and the reason we are in Monaco, so we appreciate that. And with me now, I have Martin. We saw him earlier. He was, had a ear, his phone glued to his ear, but now he has managed to extract himself from his back room and is here to tell us a little bit more about the landing in uh, the Bay Area. So, um, this is quite complicated. Explain, explain what's going on here. Yeah, I have First, to... maybe we should point out where Moffat Airfield is. It's down, yes. down here. It's about here. Moffat Airfield at the end of the, the bay. And uh, San Francisco, the airport, is in the center of these uh, circles. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Golden Gate Bridge is here at the entry of the bay. And so explain a little bit, I mean, you know, I've seen maps, but I'm not anywhere, I'm not familiar with... Yeah, this, this is, is a aeronautical map. You see the airways, uh, the black lines, mm -hmm. and then you see the circles. These are uh, terminal areas in different uh, heights. And uh, this is just to Terminal protect, areas as in yes, for, for, for air traffic San Francisco, control. Ah, the okay. air traffic control... Uh, and then Oakland? terminal uh, area, yes, that's included here. And uh, this is just to protect the traffic around the airports. So how tricky is it to organize an uh, approach for in this sort of congested situation? Yeah, for us uh, it's uh, quite a, a deal. We have to organize that with the uh, local air traffic control uh, managers and then uh, the controllers are giving the clearances into the airspace uh, they are protecting and uh, separating the aircrafts in. We are lucky to be uh, quite low for, for this uh, approach so we do not bother uh, too many of the airliners. Big commercial jets yes. that, are, that are taking off. And so, I mean, Bertrand just broke the news properly there, but I mean, we're going to be trying to do a fly, uh, you know, fly around the Golden Gate Bridge and a bit in the bay and then come yes. in down. You, you see the blue track is the originally planned arrival route to its Muffet and already the outbound route uh, to the next destination is uh, on here. But uh, we will deviate and uh, coordinate with the air traffic controllers and uh, track towards the Golden Gate Bridge and uh, go around for some photos and then coming back along the coastline to join the, the initial track again. Well, and that should be it should make some for for some great pictures. I think if you if you are in San Francisco, it's probably not a bad idea to head to Chrissy Field for a picnic if you have the opportunity to do that, because you might just see solar impulse flying over the Golden Gate Bridge or Alcatraz. Of course, all this yes, is yes, uh, that, that will be in in the end of the afternoon, and uh, the landing uh, will uh, is planned for the middle of the night. Excellent. All right. Well, we better let you get back to work. I know you have a lot of phone calls to make and a lot, to, a lot yes, of work of to do. Um, that's it from us here at Solar Impulse TV. We will be back for a Facebook Live, actually, with Bertrand. So if you have any questions for Bertrand, you can ask them on Facebook. It's going to be at 1950 local Monaco time or 1050 San Francisco time. So be sure to tune in for that. I know he's lo he loves responding to your questions. We will speak to you soon. Thanks for watching.
Trust lease between 10 and 15 knots, not more, and this between.